Oh, dear, the doorbell. I do hope I can remember where I left off. Let's see, I missed two, curl one, missed two, curl one. Uh, oh, yes? Well, oh, good morning, madam. Uh, how's your vacuum cleaner behaving these days? Oh, yes, yes. Put it in, put it, put it, put it over there. Oh, uh, miss two, curl one. Uh, how much do I owe you? Why, uh, nothing, ma'am. Uh, I was hoping you'd let me show you the new push -off. Oh, that isn't my vacuum, then, huh? You're selling them? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, if you'll just let me demonstrate. A pearl I... two, knit two, pearl... No, pearl... People selling things, interrupting. Oh, selling, selling. Oh, that reminds me. Young man, you come into the living room. No, no, leave the vacuum here in the hall. No, but, ma'am, how can I oh, demonstrate? Look, look right here. Aren't they lovely? Handmade. I knit them. Oh, very nice, ma'am, but uh, <laughs> I don't see... There's a sale. Only a dollar. We'll make them for the woman's club <laughs> to sell, to raise money for a mural for our club room. Well, what is it? <laughs> it's a tea cozy. Now, which color would you like? But I don't drink tea. Oh, but they're so ornamental. You could, well, you could put it up on the mantle. Oh, well, here's your dollar. Give me the tea cozy. Let's hope that salesman comes away from that encounter with a few pointers on salesmanship. He should, for that lady certainly put his efforts thoroughly in the shade. Speaking of shade and shadows, very shortly, that's just what we'll be doing. Speaking of shadows, I mean. The particular light and dark features we'll be considering will be eclipses, about which I confess to know very little. Anyone finding themselves in more or less the same boat, and even those who do know about them, but who want to check to see whether they have all the latest data, are cordially invited to accompany us on this excursion in science. And here's our science reporter, ready to tell us all about those celestial shadows. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? Before we go any further, Bob, I'd like to correct your last statement. In the time we have, I could scarcely tell all about eclipses, but I'll tell as much as I can of what Dr. Warren K. Green, director of the Amherst College Observatory, told me about them. Okay, Emerson, may I start us off by asking just what happens when there's an eclipse of the sun? Well, the sun is a huge mass of gas. The central portion of it is subject to high pressure from the outer gases and is compressed into a sphere. The temperature of this sphere is so high that the whole mass is glowing with an intense white light, which we call sunlight. The moon is a dark spherical object which casts a shadow, and when the shadow of the moon hits the Earth, we have what is known as an eclipse of the sun. Well, I thought that the moon went around the Earth each month. Why is it we don't have an eclipse of the sun every month? Well, Bob, the plane in which the moon revolves around the Earth is not the same as that in which the Earth revolves around the sun. However, the two planes intersect in a line which is known as the line of nodes. You're quite correct in saying that the moon goes around the Earth once each month, and to be more exact, once every 29 and a half days. And once during each revolution, the moon is in the general direction of the sun. At these times, the moon is said to be new, and it cannot be seen from the Earth because it is too close to the sun, and also because its dark side is toward the Earth. However, its shadow will not hit the Earth at new moon unless this phase occurs with the moon close to the line of nodes. This must occur at least twice every year, and may occur as many as five times in a given year. Well, the Earth is also an opaque sphere. What happens to its shadow? A little more than two weeks after new moon, the moon is in full phase and is in a direction opposite to the sun. If full moon occurs with the moon close to the line of nodes, the moon will pass into the shadow of the Earth, and we experience an eclipse of the moon. This may happen twice in any one year, but it is perfectly possible to have a year go by without any eclipse of the moon at all. Under peculiar conditions, we might have three eclipses of the moon in one year. Uh, Emerson, if my arithmetic doesn't fail me, it would seem that there are more eclipses of the sun than of the moon. And why is it that an eclipse of the sun gets talked about to such an extent? Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your accurate mental arithmetic, Mr. Stone. There are more eclipses of the sun than of the moon in a normal year. However, at the time of an eclipse of the moon, more than half the people on the Earth will see it, while an eclipse of the sun is visible over a very small area of the Earth, and hence is rare for a particular locality. There is still another reason why an eclipse of the sun attracts a lot of popular attention. The moon is of comparatively little importance to the Earth. Except to those who are romantically inclined, of course. Well, yes, of course. However, the sun is the source of all life-giving energy on the Earth, and mankind has always viewed it with a certain amount of reverence. Whenever it uh, suddenly goes down at noonday, to quote the Bible, men are very much disturbed. Even though modern scientists understand the reasons for eclipses now, that has not always been the case. 
And superstitions persist even to these modern, sophisticated times. I suppose the fact that there are two solar eclipses every year uh, given rise to the term that I remember overhearing lately when a man spoke of an annual eclipse of the sun. I'm afraid you misunderstood the term or that a badly informed person was speaking. What he was probably referring to was an annular eclipse of the sun. Oh, are there different sorts of eclipses of the sun? Oh, yes. Astronomers distinguish between three types, total, annular, and partial. The differences between these three will be better understood if we perform a little experiment right here. It may be of interest for our listeners to perform this same experiment with us. If you have a coin in your pocket... Well, literally, a coin, I think. <laughs> well, if you don't, the first joint of your finger will do uh, about as well. Well, I'm well equipped for the experiment, if that's the case. What's the connection between your finger and an eclipse? First, hold your arm out at full length with the coin, or the first joint of your finger, between one of your eyes and that picture over there on the wall. Well, that one about a foot square is probably the best, but any one will do. You notice that the first joint of your finger does not cover the picture. Now close the other eye and move your arm until your finger is central over the picture. If you're using the circular coin and if the picture were circular, you would have a close approximation of the conditions for an annular eclipse with the circular moon projected against the circular sun with a ring or annulus of bright sun around the edge of the dark new moon. Now, bring your finger toward your eye and the ring of the picture around your moon gets smaller until the scene is completely covered. Now that's a total eclipse. If now you move your head or your arm, either the earth or the moon, to the right or left, a portion of the sun will appear, and you have the conditions of a partial eclipse, with the circular moon cutting into the disk of the circular sun. Now move your finger back into the proper position for total eclipse, and walk toward the picture you will notice that the annular eclipse reappears, and you must bring the moon closer to the Earth for totality. Now, wait a minute. You're changing the distances of the moon and the sun from the Earth. I can understand why the directions change, because I know the things are going around each other in different planes. But I was taught the distance of the sun from the Earth is 93 million miles, and of the moon from the Earth is 240,000 miles. Yes, well, I... now, now, you wait a minute. Let me get a word in each way. Uh, those figures you were quoting are quite correct as averages, and I congratulate you on your memory. But the fact is that the Earth goes around the Sun in an ellipse, and the Moon goes around the Earth in another ellipse. So the distances do change from day to day, and by very appreciable amounts over moderately long periods of time. Now, in the experiment we just performed, you saw that the best conditions for totality were with your finger, that's the Moon, remember, closest to your eye, the Earth, and the Sun, that is the picture, most distant from the Earth. Check. Astronomers state it in a few words by saying that optimum conditions for totality are with the Earth at aphelion and the Moon in perigee. Good words for spelling bee. <laughs> yes, and speaking of that form of competition, Bob, I'll give you another one in connection with the eclipses. When the Earth, Moon, and Sun are in proper positions for an eclipse, they are said to be in syzygy. And try that one on your champion someday. It's spelled S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. Well, let's leave the spelling bee, by all means. Get down to cases. I have a good pair of field glasses, and I might be able to scare up a telescope. Would those give me a good view of an eclipse? Mm -mm. It's conceivably possible that you might get a very quick glimpse, but you might never see anything else, for the increased sunlight might well destroy your eyes. Never, under any circumstances, look at the sun with field glasses or a telescope, unless the object glass is covered with very dark glass or heavily fogged photographic film or plate. As a matter of fact, the best thing to do is not to use any equipment whatsoever other than the dark glass or fogged film. If you wear glasses, uh, you could fasten the dark material right over the lenses. How about a pair of good sunglasses? Could you use them? Well, not unless they're a lot denser than most. A pair of welder's glasses might do all right. The best thing to do is to experiment with various absorbing materials on any clear day. And the one which permits you to see the sun as a sharp round disk without appreciable strain will be the best to use at the time of an eclipse. Uh, by the by, Emerson, I've often wondered why it is that astronomers spend so much time and money in transporting expensive equipment to distant places just to see the sun disappear. <laughs> well, Bobby, if you were correct in assuming that they just want to see the sun, it certainly would be difficult to understand why the expeditions are made. As a matter of fact, astronomers go to regions of total eclipse for just the opposite reasons. At the time of an eclipse, 
portions of the sun appear that can never be directly seen without the eclipse. Well, that's a puzzling statement if I ever heard one. You mind explaining it in more detail? The portion of the sun that you see through your absorbing material is the so-called photosphere of the sun, that part which shines with the brilliant white light. Outside of that, there is a lot more hot gas which also shines. However, the light from these outer layers, known technically as the prominences and the corona, is so faint in comparison with that from the photosphere that they are never visible to the unaided eye except when the moon cuts out the photosphere. Within recent years, instruments have been developed that will permit observations to be taken of the prominences of the corona even without an eclipse. However, the coronascope is in its infancy and can't be said to give really excellent results as yet, but the prominences can be thoroughly studied even without an eclipse. Thank you, Emerson. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to have a copy of a paper especially prepared for us by Dr. Warren K. Green, director of the Amherst College Observatory, who provided the facts we've just brought you, a paper which contains this story and other things regarding eclipses we haven't had time to include, all you have to do to get your copies, address your request to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 217, entitled Celestial Shadows. That's Celestial Shadows, scientific paper number 217. Your paper will be forwarded to you free of charge. We have now arrived at that portion of our program which we regularly devote to the answering of the scientific inquiries which your listeners have sent in. The answers will be as scientifically sound and up-to-date as it is possible for them to be, since they are based on data provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or other equally trustworthy institutions. Well, Emerson, are you ready? Here's the first one. It comes from a gentleman in Knoxville, Iowa. He asks for information regarding the color changes on cobalt chloride caused by humidity and air pressure. And he'd also like any information regarding a simple method of weather prediction. Cobalt chloride shows changes in relative humidity in the air. Uh, blue color indicates dryness, pink an increase in the humidity. But it doesn't tell anything about changes in air pressure. And we don't know of any material which changes color with changing air pressure. Incidentally, this method is not especially reliable in predicting weather. In order to be really accurate, it is necessary to use various instruments such as meteorological stations employ. Well, that would seem to take care of that, listener. Now, this next matter for our attention comes from a young man who asks, after a caterpillar has made its cocoon, how long does it take to change to a butterfly or moth, whichever the case may be? The caterpillar makes a cocoon which will turn into a moth the following spring. It makes its cocoon in the summertime. Butterfly larvae are worms, which, uh, for pupation, that is, transformation from larvae to adult stage, prepare chrysalises. Often the larvae are transformed into butterflies within a few weeks to a month. This next gentleman writes, Some time ago I noticed you mentioned uh, litharge and glycerin mixture to make water cement for cementing a fish aquarium together. Do you suppose this could be used to stop water from seeping in after a heavy rain at the base of the cellar wall? Or would it be necessary to dig down from the outside to put in drain tile? And the best way to keep water from seeping into the cellar is to tar the outside wall or to build drain tile. However, there are special waterproof commercial cement finishes which can be spread on the inside of the walls. Litharge and glycerin would not be practical on this large scale, I'm afraid, but a mason or a hardware store can recommend one of these waterproof finishes which will serve our listeners' purpose. A lady at Old Orchard Beach, Maine, writes, I have a glass teapot which I leave full of water at night. In the morning, there are large white flakes and sediment in the bottom. Please tell me the cause of this. The sediment may be due to several things. First, it may be a deposit of hard water, which, on standing, loses carbon dioxide and deposits calcium carbonate. Or, second, it may be a slight dissolving of the glass by the water. Is there any way to play detective, scientifically, of course, to find out which of the two it is? Yes. Our friend can tell which it is by boiling water in a tea kettle thoroughly. And after it has boiled and cooled in the kettle, put it in the glass teapot. If no deposition occurs, then it was the hard water which caused it. If something is deposited, some of the glass has slightly dissolved. Well, the time at our disposal has more than slightly dissolved, so I'll just say thank you, Emerson Markham, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.